Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Dr. Alan Christensen. And Dr. Alan Christensen is a naturopathic endocrinologist who focuses on thyroid function, adrenal health, and metabolism. He has been actively practicing in Scottsdale since 1996 and is the founding physician behind Integrative Health. He is a New York Times bestselling author whose books include The Metabolism Reset Diet, The Adrenal Reset Diet, and The Complete Idiot's Guide to thyroid disease. Dr. Christensen regularly appears on national media like Dr. Oz, The Doctors, and The Today Show. So while we often talk about being betrayed by a family member, partner, or friend, today we're going to talk about something a little bit different, being betrayed by the diet industry. If you are struggling with your weight, if you've been a lifelong yo-yo dieter, or if you just can't understand where that new belly weight came from, you're going to want to listen in. I'm speaking with my friend, Dr. Alan Christensen, a brilliant brilliant naturopathic endocrinologist who's going to explain all that and so much more. Here he is. Okay, everybody, you are going to so love this next conversation I'm having because I'm with Dr. Alan Christensen, Dr. C, and he's going to be talking about two things, actually. Number one, how the diet industry betrays us. And number two, how you know, after betrayal, there's so much stress. And very often that leaves us with weight gain as if it weren't hard enough. Now we have to deal with that too. But we have Dr. C with us, who's going to help us through it all. Welcome, Dr. C. Hey, Debbie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super jazzed to be here with you. Oh, thanks so much. So let's let's start with here. Someone has been betrayed by either a family member, partner, a friend, uh, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, there are so many leftovers and one of them can be weight gain. How does that even happen? You know, pretty wild thing. So most people have heard about the fight or flight response and there's certain ways that our bodies react differently when we've been in some acute stress or danger, like a, like a major betrayal. And, you know, in med school, they joked about fight or flight and also there being other, other Fs, but one F you don't hear about is famine. Mm. So these responses were typically triggered during times of danger, and those also tended to correlate with times of food shortage or famine. So our body changes how fuel in the blood, like the fuel we get from our food, whether that goes to our muscles or whether that goes to fat tissue, to visceral fat or subcutaneous fat. So a stress response engenders a famine response in the body, and it changes the way food is metabolized. So if I'm understanding this right, it's like here we we are, we have this acute stress, and the body perceives this as, as just acknowledges that it's some sort of stressor and almost looks at it like, okay, well, you know what? We have to store now yeah. everything. We can't afford to burn it. Is that right? It's spot on. And think about it, you can think about it like in terms of economics, uh, your, your body putting fuel into your muscles or your bones, that's like a long-term investment. And your body putting fuel in the belly fat, that's like cash under the mattress. So if someone's, you know, they're hearing rumors, there's layoffs at work and they just got some, some big bonus, that's going to be, they're going to hang on to that. That's not going to go into a long-term investment. And that's exactly what your body does when it's under a state of betrayal or stress or trauma. So why is it, is it, is there a reason then why when we are putting on weight, let's say during some stressful situation, like a betrayal, that it would be, um, more, you know, in, in the belly, as opposed to, let's say, you know, your, your legs, your your other areas. Yeah, there sure is. So part of that response, what happens is that your body has, has this signaling molecule called insulin and it's often been given a bad rap, but it really just tells the body whether or not it's a good time to take in and store things or whether it's time to burn things. And insulin can respond to different parts of the system. So skeletal muscle responds in some ways, and then visceral fat responds in others. And specifically, when cortisol, when the stress hormone cortisol, when it's not being made in a morning burst and then a nighttime shutoff, you know, once that rhythm gets disrupted, then insulin has a stronger attraction to visceral fat. So yeah, the same, the same amount of food, whether it's fats or carbs or whatever, it goes toward visceral fat when, when stressors make cortisol levels abnormal. Mm-hmm. And then, and this is the type of fat that's much more dangerous for us. Like this is where our waist circumference has more to do with health and let's say just the number on the scale. You know, spot on. And here's a bizarre thing that 
that has shown up in rather recent research. So the visceral fat is not even dangerous. And inflammation in visceral fat is a good thing, would you believe it or not? Oh, wow. But, yeah, but what happens is that, have, have you ever seen like those, I just thought this analogy recently, like those, those lawn fountains or like a yard fountain where there's a bowl, like all these stacked bowls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first bowl gets filled, that overflows to the second bowl and so on and so on. Your body does something like that. And visceral fat is one of the lower bowls, and that's where your body's fuel goes. And the bowl below that, if it overflows, is then into the liver tissue. And if the liver can't store anymore, that's when it starts to make a different thing called organ fat. And that's fat inside of its cells and between its cells. That's when all the danger sets in. So visceral fat is really a protective mechanism. But once, it, once you can't store anything more in it, then all the bad things start to happen. Wow. Yikes. So here we are. We're struggling. We, we're not feeling good about uh, maybe we're not eating as well as we should because that's the last thing on our mind at the time. And now we're gaining weight and and then we diet. And tell us where the problem comes in with that. Because we've, we've been, I mean, if it's not even from betrayal, I mean, certainly people have been dieting forever. And it's, you know, we always hear, well, the diet failed and it's not you, it's the diet. What's going on? Why does the, how does the diet industry betray us? Well, completely. And, and that's the thing. Someone is under stress or trauma and they want something to help. And I, I don't know if this has been a deliberate act on any part of the industry, but overall, the industry does just set people up to fail. So what happens is that they'll push for food restriction. And that might be, here's a list of bad foods. You know, right now that's often carbs. It used to be fats. There could be different food categories that have been good or bad, or maybe it's total food intake, but there's, there's some restriction. And the pitfall is that if someone's stuck in a cycle to where they've got, their, their liver's not working well, they've got heightened levels of stress hormones, they may, they may have a short-term loss of some pounds on the scale, but it's almost always the case they're going to lose more lean body mass than anything else. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is they're, they're just on an arc that's going to make them rebound and go back even higher than they were before. And that's so frustrating. Yeah. That, yeah. So, what, so what's, a, what's a better way to go? Because it's true. I mean, how often is it someone tries what it's that yo-yo dieting, you know, they go on one diet and then they do lose a little bit and they gain it back plus, and then it's okay, let me just try something else. And it's this cycle of deprivation and binge and, and it's, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting. And it's uh, disheartening. You know, it, it creates higher levels of stress and more social dissonance. And of course it creates the risk for all the major chronic diseases. So, so yeah, the insight that I've had is that the, the liver is a big part of the story and the odd thing is that there's two ways the liver stores fuel. You know, one type is a very slow burning kind of fuel and one burns a little faster and you need the faster burning one to burn the slower burning one, almost like kindling for a campfire. Mm -hmm. And if you can get the kindling back up again and clear out some of the old slow burning fuel that's stuck, then you can make it to where the liver works normally. And in that, in that state, the body can maintain healthy weight and healthy energy the way it did before. Okay, so Dr. C, I just picture all of my listeners leaning in and, and increasing their volume because they, now they're like, okay, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> they're all listening now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a trick. I, I outlined a 28-day process. And the exciting thing is that as important as your liver is, it's also really resilient and it can fix itself promptly. So that the basic idea is you want to have a low amount of fuel. And by fuel, I'm talking about really fats, carbs, even, even ketones and alcohol could be put in that category because they're all the same thing at the level of your liver. They're all just one molecule called oxaloacetate. So you need a low amount of fuel and an adequate amount of protein and then enough nutrients to support the liver's reactions. The pitfall about just lowering food intake or even fasting is that you're depriving the liver of things that it needs to function while you're asking it to work harder. Mm -hmm. And we're hungry if it's not yeah. the right, the right combination of foods. So is there, is there, you're saying that it doesn't even like the type of food doesn't necessarily matter or it does? Well, the type of food sure can be helpful. So I set this program up to where there was a fair amount of good plants that are high in phytonutrients that support the liver function. Mm -hmm. And also that the overall effect of it is alkalizing. You know, there's some pitfalls where if someone does have a rapid breakdown of stored fat, 
there's a lot of things like uric acid that go into circulation. And it's easy to have uh, gout attacks or gallstones form if there's too much fat loss, it's too quick, unless it's done in the right ways. Yeah, so the th- types of food can sure make it go smoother. Mm-hmm. So is there... Because he, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm in the mind of, of my listener, and he or she is saying, well, you know, man, that just sounds, it sounds great, but it sounds really hard. Is it the kind of thing that is hard to do? It, how do you know if, it's, if you're doing it right or doing it well? In general, a, a good way to gauge how well weight loss is working is to know how much of it is really waste loss. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So typical, typical formulas suggest that a woman would see anywhere from like eight to 10 pounds of weight lost for every inch lost from her waist. And I would argue that 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 level or more weight per inch is a clear sign of muscle loss. So if you're seeing that you're having a more substantial loss where it's like perhaps four or five pounds or less per inch, that's a clear sign that it is going right. So the other question you asked is, is it hard? And you know, I, I never like to, it's a hard thing to quantify. You can't like put numbers on that. Uh, the, first, the first couple of days on the 20-day process, many do find that challenging. We've set it up to where there are unlimited foods that are available. So if someone does need to snack or have a bit more, they've got options to help get them by during those first few days. Usually after day three or day four, people find that it's pretty smooth and rather automated. And a lot of the process is made to where it's very simple. It's Really, you're doing two shakes and one meal, and there's simple guidelines for all of those things, and then you've got options for unlimited snacks. So it's not a lot of stuff to figure out. Now, something else that's different about this is I do really reduce and do small amounts of exercise during the 28 days Mm -hmm. because we're trying to get one kind of fuel back into your liver, and as wonderful as exercise is, it makes that part harder. So people have often struggled if they tried to lower food intake while they're training really hard. But during this process, I do intentionally reduce exercise. And I think that makes it go a bit smoother also. Mm -hmm. So how should somebody be feeling if they they start this and and it's going well for them? Well, what what will they be feeling? Will they be sleeping better? I mean, like, what are some signs that let them know, okay, this is this is good? You know, that's that is one that is often mentioned is sleeping better. And the funny thing that people often don't realize is that quality of sleep has a lot to do with blood sugar regulation. So there's falling asleep and staying asleep. And the staying asleep part, throughout the night, your liver is releasing glucose to keep your blood sugar stable. And when it's not doing that well, that's when someone could wake up with high fasting glucose. It's not from high high blood sugar in the morning is not from eating carbs because you didn't just eat carbs. You know, it's your Mm -hmm. liver not doing its job properly. So sleep is often better. After about the first four or five days, People typically see more steady, even healthy energy levels. And then also subjectively, a lot of symptoms that relate to just ongoing inflammation tend to be lower. So Mm -hmm. joint pain, muscle pain, uh, brain fog, digestive irregularity. Typically, we see improvement in a lot of areas like that. Mm. And can we go back? I'd love to go back to the issue of sleep because one of the things, you know, I have people taking the uh, the post betrayal sim- syndrome quiz. And if I were to say what is one of the absolute top things that I see with everybody struggling to heal from betrayal is extreme exhaustion. They're mm-hmm. so tired, but they're not sleeping well. Um, they're, you know, so here they are. They're, they're, they would love to sleep, but they just can't get that sleep. Can you talk about how that, why that's going on? For sure. That's a huge thing. You know, that's been called the wired and tired pattern. So your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, that's your body's mechanism that buffers against stress responses. And when things are smooth, you make a big burst of cortisol. I think of it like your internal coffee machine. You know, you make a bunch around when the sun comes up, that wakes you up. And then throughout the day, you're gradually shutting that off. And somewhere around late afternoon, early evening, your cortisol should take a real big drop off. And that's almost like on a seesaw that pushes up your melatonin. And then you go into deep, refreshing sleep. When someone's gone through betrayal or big, big stressors in life, what happens is that that cortisol cycle becomes altered. And rather than make a lot in the morning and shut it off at night, it could be off in about three different ways. They might be making too much all the time, They might be making it exactly backward where there's too little in the morning and too much at night, or it could be more just low and flatlined throughout the day. 
But all of those take away from the normal internal cues of just waking and sleeping. And you know what's so interesting about that? Because so often people would think that, well, my cortisol is just really low and I and I need, you know, to boost my adrenals and and have more. And and I can see that we're really not getting to the the exact reason why it's not functioning the right way. Yeah. So that you bring up a really great point. And I've, I'm really passionate about clarifying this for people. There's a concept of adrenal fatigue, and it's a bit of a misnomer. Now, we just mentioned how someone could have low cortisol and their body mm-hmm. seems like it could need more. So there's two, there's two completely different ways that can look the same that can both be low cortisol. So one scenario is someone's adrenals are unable to make cortisol or the body's not telling them to. And this we call Addison's disease or Addison's syndrome. And, and yeah, cortisol levels are low. When we look deeply at the body's signals, they're asking the adrenals to work, but the adrenals cannot work well enough. And we can also measure that there's an immune attack against them. Now, there's another scenario that's completely different, but on the surface, it looks the same. And that's what's called adrenal fatigue. So someone can have low cortisol in this state. And the difference is that the body wants there to be low cortisol. So if we measure how the brain is talking to the adrenals, it's not telling them to work hard. It's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's encouraging them to put out very little cortisol. So the adrenals are doing exactly what they're told. And someone in that state, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but if they did do things that would push their adrenals, like if they used caffeine or even some herbs like licorice, or if they took cortisol medications, they would probably have a short-term burst in energy. But sadly, they'd be pushing themselves further and further away from their recovery because that's what the body is trying to avoid. Mm. And I remember back when I was in that state and I was running and doing hot yoga. Are those probably the two worst things I could do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if the body is really stressed and cortisol levels are low, it's the system trying to rest itself, trying to give itself the space to recover. And exercise is awesome. You know, it's something that's just great, but it can be a stressor. And it really is. So when things are stable and your body can tolerate some stress, then that's the kind of stress that causes us to rebound and come back stronger. But if we're already collapsed from just too much stress, then that's just one more, you know, one more thing on that burden. Mm -hmm. So it really is a question of get tested because you don't want to treat what looks like one thing and could definitely be something else. And, you know, I'll bring up another one because if I were to say what is the second most common physical symptom that I see, it's a gut issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this could be anything. I mean, it could be constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, if you don't mind, let me just back up one step because you talked about getting tested and and I want to just go deeper for your listeners. Sure. They should. And the pitfall is that in most cases, the doctors will just test cortisol and it'll all look the same, whether it really is the body not able to make it or the body choosing not to make it. So if nothing else, if your doctor doesn't already, please have them measure ACTH, ACTH. That's adrenal corticotropic hormone. That's the signal from the brain that I was alluding to, and you can measure that. So if the body is choosing not to make cortisol, ACTH is low because the brain is not telling the adrenals to work, even though cortisol is low. If the body is truly unable to make cortisol, ACTH is high. The brain is yelling at them to work, but they're unable to do so. So that's a simple thing you can ask for your, your doctor or practitioner to add on to help make that distinction. Okay, that, and that's terrific because at least we'll know the reason why we're not, uh, the cortisol isn't working the way it's supposed to. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned the intestinal tract. Is that mm-hmm. a big part of this? And for sure. So what's happening there is it's, it's really like a, a whole separate brain, almost like a separate entity, so to speak. You know, we had this, this, this tube. If we look way back on evolutionary scale, the first time that we were more than just single cells, we were really just a tube and stuff came in one end and went out the other. And over time, we developed more apparatus and appendages on the tube, you know, if we flash forward in evolutionary history. But the brain itself is an appendage and the tube was there first. And we always talk about, you know, gut feelings or visceral reactions or whatnot. And there's a thing called the enteric nervous system. And the majority of digestive symptoms are variants on either irritable bowel syndrome, or inflammatory bowel disease. And both of those are very neurologic conditions. So when the nerve signals between the brain and the intestinal tract become altered, the propulsion from mouth to butt, the whole sequence of Mm -hmm. that, becomes thrown off. 
And that's where these symptoms come in from. And yes, stressors can certainly be big triggers of all that. So what happens if we are having digestive issues and then we go on, a, a, let's say, a typical diet because our gut isn't working well, but we're not happy with our weight? What's the, what's the downside of that? What goes on then? Well, so the big pitfall is that most diets nowadays involve restricting a lot of food categories. And the health of your gut, you know, I think most folks have heard quite a bit about the, the revolutionary data around the microbiome and the relevance of our good bacteria. So they're, they're as good as they are nourished. And there's about 17 different kinds of fiber that ideally you'd be getting a nice variety of and nice quantities of throughout the day to keep your microbiome stable and able to withstand stress, to be more resilient. But the sad thing is that a lot of restrictive diets are just, just cutting out large numbers of food categories. And people may be down to as low as like three or four out of those 17 fiber types. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So now here's somebody who she's not, let's just take a typical person that I see. She's, she's not sleeping. She has gut issues. She's let's say 20, 30 pounds overweight. She's looking at this belly, like what the heck, where'd this come from? Uh, and, but she wants to get her health back. She doesn't want to mask anything. She wants to heal. What, what does she, what does she do as far as getting her health back together with her liver and her cortisol? Like, just a general, of course, you're not diagnosing her, but just right. a general, what, what can she do? So one, one mindset I would put out is to realize that there's a lot of good day-to-day -day habits that one should consider and one should embark on. And there's times where there's a special project the body needs. And in situations like that, you know, I've used the, the, the term reset quite a bit, is that you want to dedicate some time towards the project of really changing how your system works. And it's worth considering strategies that may not be the same as what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but are for affecting some kind of change that can last. And the cool thing about the body and its resilience is that when that comes back again, then you're, you're better off and you can withstand things and be, be stable again and not, not have to always be managing these symptoms. So the main thought is to dedicate some time to really make it, make it a project and do some steps towards the goal, not so much of just just changing a number on a scale or changing a symptom in the short term, but really regenerating the body's own capacity to heal itself. And I, I love what you're saying here because it's not about masking a symptom. It's really about healing, like deep healing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay. So someone is, you know, they're willing to change. And, and I'm saying willing because willing is a huge word when it comes to healing. I'm finding physically, mentally, emotionally, willingness is a, a huge piece of this. So they're willing to make some lifestyle habits, but they're, they're also really wary because, well, first of all, one of the biggest things with betrayal is, uh, you know, the person they've trusted the most proved untrustworthy, whether it's a family mm. member, partner, friend. And now they may have been burned a few times from the diet industry. So yeah. so trust is a little they may be having a challenge with with trust. What's a way to sort of dip their toe in and be like, OK, you know what, maybe maybe this is safe and OK and I can trust this. You know, something I've encouraged for people with the metabolism reset diet is to take a dedicate a week. You know, the process is 28 days, but commit to a week and expect the first few days to have some fatigue or some digestive changes, but see where you're at towards the end of that week. And most people are seeing that they've, they've figured it out. They've got momentum going with it. They're starting to see some daylight emerge in terms of those symptoms. And then in those cases, then this is really going to be a good fit and they should embark upon the remaining 21 days. If they're a week in and they feel less confident about that or uncertain, then they're certainly welcome to, to step off. But that's that's an easy way to gain a certain level of trust and comfort. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that what you're saying about really just the first couple of days, because if someone doesn't know to expect something like that, and yeah. I can easily see them, you know, being a little bit tired or not feeling 100% and then they say, oh, well, this is that that's because this doesn't work for me. And that's not the case. It's, it's almost like you have to ride that part out because... It's once you get past that, you really see the benefit. Exactly. Beautiful. So, Dr. C., what do you want to make sure everyone knows before we wrap up? You know, the thing I want people to know and come away from this more than anything else by far is that your body is just the most amazing thing in the known universe. I mean, no exaggeration. It really is. And it fixes itself. It heals itself. And this could be a, might be a difficult thing to embrace right now, but we come back stronger from events like this. You know, it's, it's never welcome and no one ever wants to build character through trauma and through stress and through betrayal. But at the end of the day, when we do come back, 
we're stronger, we're more compassionate, we can understand the plight of others, we can resonate with them more effectively. But we, we do heal, you know, psychologically and physically. So that's the thing to hold on to is just, you know, don't let any embers of hope die out. And, and do know also that the healing process is something that it tends to meander more than it progresses. So expect to have some occasional breakthroughs and expect to have some setbacks. And don't be alarmed or surprised when they show up. But do know that we are inherently survivors. You know, we are the ancestors of those who did get through the tough times and the trauma. And we've got that hardwired into us. So just hold on to that vision. And I love that for so many reasons, because we normally think of betrayal as we, we, you know, hold on because mentally and emotionally there will be the breakthroughs and the setbacks. But what you're saying is it's a physical the physical aspect of it too, where there will be you know, the breakthroughs, but then we may feel a little bit tired, a little bit sluggish, and we may want to sort of fall off, but stick with that. And, and we can we can really rise above in that area as well. Exactly. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. So how do we learn more about you and, and tell us just, you know, about the book and, and we'll wrap it up from there. <laughs> you know, the book itself and the tablets and reset diet, it's a, it's the 21, 28 day program that walks through all of this and anywhere you get books, it's available. Um, if you've got a local bookstore still, <laughs> please give mm-hmm. us some love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can always use that. Yeah. And Alan Christensen, you can find me on just, just online, drchristensen.com, pretty easy to find. But yeah, just grab the book and try things out. And I think you can see some real good change. Oh, Dr. C, I want to thank you so much. I mean, your your work is is so, it's just so brilliant. And I know you've had thousands of people benefiting from all you've you've taught in the way of adrenals and thyroid. And, and I know there's so much more. And now let's get our livers back together again so we could truly be our, our physical, mental, emotional, psychological, and spiritual best. I want to thank you so much for all you share with us today. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Pleasure to be with you. So that makes total sense. When the body is stressed, it's in survival mode, which could be interpreted as famine. And so the body holds on to fat for when we may need it at a later date. It also makes sense that something like betrayal truly wreaks havoc on your body as well as your mind. So it's important to learn from amazing people like Dr. C. Stay in touch with him by going to drchristiansen.com and we'll have all of his information in the show notes at pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. The body has a tremendous capacity to heal and when it does, it performs beautifully. Instead of masking or ignoring an issue, face it just like we we do when we're healing from betrayal. And when you do, you'll see how resilient the body is and how healthy and happy with your body you become. And as you know, lots of physical, mental, and emotional symptoms are left in the wake of betrayal. So to find out what may be lingering for you, take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz at pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz and let us support you. Go to Facebook and join our group, Women Hacking Betrayal, where we give information, tools, and support to help you move forward and heal once and for all. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough.